For those of you guys who know me, uh, you will know that my favorite creature in the world is an orca or a killer whale, and I got the absolute pleasure of talking to a killer whale scientist. So in today's episode, it's a long one, so sit back, grab your popcorn, and hear about the amazing world of killer whales. We talk all about how they travel, how they communicate, what kind of society they live in, about their social structures. What makes a killer whale a killer whale? What they feed on? We also discussed Lolita, which is a killer whale that has been in captivity for over 40 years, and what it would mean to potentially release her or how they could release her, and the fact that there may still be her family members out there in the wild that we know of, and if she still knows the language, could potentially reunite. I don't know, I got very emotional. I just, it was incredible. Michael is so great at explaining things. And yeah, this is just one of my favorite episodes ever. I hope you guys enjoy it as much as I did. Of course, if you'd like to support me and help me continue the work I'm doing, it would mean the world to me. You can become a patron or head on over to oceanpancake.com and get yourself a Plastic is the Killer t-shirt. It actually has a killer whale on it because, you know, killer whales aren't the real killers, they're the plastic. Anyway, it's, I, I love killer whales. I love orcas. This is, this is so exciting. Thank you so much, Michael, for being here with me today. And yeah, um, we talked for an hour and I had about a hundred more questions, but I thought to try and keep it, keep it down for you guys. But yeah, if you enjoyed this, let me know, send me an email, send me a message. You can find me on all the social medias, Ocean Pancake. Um, join the Facebook group, Ocean Pancake, uh, and let me know what you think about this episode or any other ones, what you'd like to hear. I love hearing from you guys. Yeah. Every day, there's a new news story about the crisis facing our ocean. Whether it's the plastic issue, overfishing, pollution. If the oceans die, we die. Fortunately, we have plenty of environmental activists, marine conservationists, and eco-warriors who are out there every day fighting to protect our oceans and our Earth. On the Ocean Pancake Podcast, we're going to be hearing from some of them about how to decrease our environmental footprint, go plastic-free, participate in ocean conservation, cleanups, and even maybe some marine science. So, welcome to the Ocean Pancake Podcast, where the goal is sustainability and living a turquoise life. My name is Kat Andreskova, and I'm your host today. Let's get into this week's episode. Hi, and welcome to the Ocean Pancake Podcast. Today, I'm here with Michael Weiss, who is a biologist at the Center for Whale Research and a PhD candidate at the University of Exeter. Welcome to the podcast. Yeah, great. Thanks for having me. I am so excited about this episode. This is one of the ones I've been looking forward to the most because whales are some of my favorite ocean creatures. Yeah, they're uh, me too, obviously. <laughs> they're, they're, pretty, they're pretty spectacular. Killer whales in particular, I, I find them. Um, just absolutely fascinating. One of the, I think, I forget who it was, but there's a, uh, there's a paper published as kind of an introduction to a special issue of a, you know, whale science journal. And the, this introduction basically said, killer whales may be the most fascinating animal on the planet. And I have yet to hear anybody disagree with that. So. I definitely agree with it. Uh, I consider them my spirit animal. <laughs> they're, okay. they're the one yeah. creature that I cannot wait to see in the wild. So that's on my bucket list. Excellent. So can you tell me how this all began? How did you fall in love with the ocean and how did you start working with killer oils? Yeah, so um, I grew up uh, in on the coast of Florida. Um, not a lot of killer whales there, but a lot of ocean and a lot of uh, other kinds of ocean life. Um, and yeah, so I, it really started, you know, just living on the ocean and, and watching, you know, these families of dolphins or well, groups of dolphins come by and trying to figure out what kind of, what affected when they were timing, when they came by and how they interacted with each other and, uh, just finding their whole lives really fascinating. Um, and of course I was also part of the free willy generation. So that, that didn't hurt either. Um. But honestly, I've been interested. I've wanted to study killer whales since I was six years old, and I don't remember what exactly what what the switch was. But as long as I can remember 
having an idea of what I, what I wanted to do with my life, um, working with killer whales was the main thing. Uh, the second thing was being a paleontologist, but that hasn't quite panned out yet. Uh, hopefully we'll talk a bit about this later because I think it's a really important issue. Much to my kind of uh, slight embarrassment at this point in my life, I think one of the things that did get me interested with killer whales when I was young was uh, SeaWorld and other marine parks and aquariums, mm -hmm. which I'm not... Um, at this point in my life, I, I don't support or, or, or agree with, but as a kid, uh, it was something that kind of um, opened that world up to me a bit. Well, it's definitely a topic that I do want to talk to you about since there are a lot of pros and cons. Certain people say that it does have younger kids, you know, uh, fall in love with the ocean and get the chance to see these creatures, which then leads to, you know, education and all that. So uh, it's, the, it's the debate of, you know, the few bad things for the greater good kind of thing. So we'll get into that later. <laughs> but, um, yeah, yeah, it's, there's a lot to talk about there. Yeah, I know what you mean. Like I was looking at some photos from my family and I, I saw myself like, I don't know, I was probably like five, six, sitting next to like a little beluga beluga whale, you know, like patting it in an aquarium. And I'm like, oh, yeah. oh no. <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, I think it was the last time I was kind of moving um, when I was moving out here to the UK where I'm currently based and I was going through stuff and I found like this keychain from Discovery Cove of me riding a dolphin. I'm like, oh God, <laughs> gotta get rid of that. Yeah. Or, you know, keep it for education's sake. Like this is what I do. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, cool. Wow. So you've definitely known for a long time what you want to do and how did, how did the journey to actually study killer whale, killer whales happen? So you're a PhD candidate. What did it look like before this point? Yeah, so um, uh, it started, I, I went on um, a, a whale watching kind of trip. I got involved with NRDC, which is the National uh, Resource Defense Council in the United States. I got involved with them when I was very young um, as part of during their campaign to uh, preserve Laguna San Ignacio, which is a gray whale breeding ground in Baja, California. Um, so I got involved at that point, basically just campaigning for them, trying to you know, get people to boycott. Uh, it was Mitsubishi was trying to build a salt plant in this gray whale breeding ground. So we were trying to boycott Mitsubishi. Um, that got me down to Baja, California to actually see these gray whales, which was one of the most uh, incredible experiences of my life. There I met um, a good friend of mine, Cindy Hansen, who uh, at the time worked also at the Whale Museum on San Juan Island. Uh, after talking with her, um, I ended up doing an internship at the Whale Museum when I was uh, about to start my undergrad and did that for a couple summers, did in, uh, an education and research internship at the Whale Museum, which got me to meet um, another good friend of mine now, uh, Monica Wieland, who runs the Orca Behavior Institute that she and I co-founded in 2015. Um, from there, I wrote my undergrad thesis on Southern resident killer whale social structure um, and, and vocalizations, and then, uh, yeah, presented that thesis to the person who is now my PhD supervisor, who kind of took me under his wing a bit. And uh, yeah, so now I'm working with the University of Exeter and the Center for Whale Research. Wow, what, what a journey. <laughs> yeah, a lot of different organizations, a lot of different stuff, but all, all whales. Yeah, yeah, so it just shows you really just gotta, you know, put in, put in the years and the work and meet people and just keep doing what you're passionate about to <laughs> yeah the I, I think there's two things on one hand right I think I was extremely extremely lucky and obviously mm -hmm. like very very privileged I was able to volunteer my time as an intern um for a couple years and not everybody's able to do that and I I think I I think this is something I I really do believe in ocean conservation in general we need to get better about um the kinds of opportunities we make available to people. So mm -hmm. like I said, I had the ability and privilege to be able to say, oh, I'm going to volunteer my time, which let me not just, you know, get experience and learn th things, but like you said, get to meet people who then opened up more opportunities for me. Um, and that kind of is the way it goes, right? You either volunteer your time or in some cases in, you, you know, some groups actually ask you to pay to go yeah. on these research expeditions. Um, and I, I, I just think if we want to really broaden the the base of people that we're talking to and and that are involved in marine biology and conservation we need to 
I mean, it's hard. The money's just not there, but we need to be able to offer people fair pay for their time, even at, you know, introductory levels. But that's kind of my, my little soapbox, I guess. <laughs> no, I have a whole episode about this, actually, because one of my good friends, uh, Sarah G, she has now been working in just animal conservation in general for about five years. So she did five years worth of internships where, she, as you said, she either worked for free or then paid to work um, to get her first paying job in Costa Rica. So it took so long for her to be able to get that. And if you want to check it out or if anyone wants to check it out, um, it's I think I titled it something like the, the cost of working in conservation, because it's true. You have to have that privilege. You have to have that time and the ability. Um, and it's just such a shame because so many people can't do that. Um, so it really restricts um, the people who do work in it. And unfortunately, there is not that much money, which is sad because it's very important. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's a shame that the, you know, there's there's not as much funding for, you know, just basic on the ground conservation work as there really needs to be. Um, it's, it really is a shame. And you know, I think I'm, I'm relatively hopeful that things can change if we all kind of work together to, to change it. Uh, yeah, well, it's about getting the conversation going. And I think now with a bigger uh, you know, lens on the whole uh, conservation and environmentalism, we have a chance of potentially getting more funding, which is you know, positive. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, now back to killer whales, because that's what yes. we're really here to talk <laughs> about. Um, so you are studying or study the social structures of killer whales. So I, I'm dying to know, tell me about them. What is the, what's happening in these killer whale families? Yeah, so my main, um, my main kind of area of study is killer whale society, killer whale social structures. Um, I study that in a huge variety of ways, but mostly by, you know, looking at who's hanging out together, who's interacting with each other, and building these social networks and, and analyzing those. So killer whale society is actually really um, interesting and really varied. So I study the southern resident killer whales. Uh, mm -hmm. Resident killer whales are kind of the killer whales most people are familiar with. Um, they uh, live in the, Pacific, the Northeast Pacific. So my southern residents, they're in Washington state, which most people wouldn't think of as southern, but it's kind of the southern an end of resident killer whale habitat um, and they are salmon specialists so they mm -hmm. eat exclusively salmon because of what they eat um, they're able to live in these huge groups so the southern residents are um, right now 72 whales uh, and they live in what's called a matrilineal social structure so uh, we don't necessarily know that they're matriarchal, although we suspect they are, but they're definitely matrilineal. So both males and females stay in their uh, mother's group their entire life. They never leave. Um, and those matrilines that then form from that, which is, you know, a, a female and all of her immediate descendants, related matrilines um, associate in what we call pods. Um, my population has three pods, J, K, and L. Each of these pods has a unique dialect. Um, they have, you know, their own kinds of travel patterns. Uh, they might even have slightly different um, risks that concert from a conservation perspective because of that. Um, we we find that these in these uh, killer whale pods, um, the older females are the ones who tend to be leaders. So when they're moving around in their salmon um, foraging areas, it's the older females who lead movement, most likely because they have seen, you know maybe 40, 50, 60 years. Uh, in some cases where we suspect some whales may have lived into their 90s, we think they might be able to live into their hundreds. Um, so these older females lead group movement. Um, and when females catch fish, they will share it 90% of the time. Whoa. So 90% of the fish that a female catches, she'll share with at least one other whale. Males, less so. Males <laughs> tend to forage a bit more on their own, a bit further offshore. They'll share about a quarter of the fish that they catch. Um, they don't tend to lead group movement as much, even as they get older, which is interesting. Um, and so these, these males are basically big old mama's boys. Um, oh. Male killer whales are much, much heavier than female killer whales. Um, they've got these big old dorsal fins and these big kind of silly looking pectoral flippers and their flukes curl over. 
uh, and we suspect they might not have you know quite the turning angle and agility that the females have um, so when uh, so adult females uh, preferentially will share food with their sons over their daughters especially once they get to maturity and uh, males will follow their mom more and this ends up having huge effects on their survival so um, when a male killer whale's mother dies, his likelihood of dying in the next two years increases by eightfold. Um, yeah, and females have, a, have an effect as well, but it's much, much smaller. And actually that effect gets bigger for the males the older he is. Uh, we suspect this might actually be because his mother is older and therefore more experienced and a better mother. Um, but it's not, and it's not just a mother to offspring thing either. Uh, we've recently published a paper showing that actually grandmothers have a similar effect on their grand offspring. So when a whale's grandmother dies the next two years, they have a heightened mortality risk. So it's a, it's a really mother and grandmother centric society um, where these males are kind of being provisioned by uh, their mothers to keep them alive as long as they can. And we think the reason they've evolved to do that is because uh, in resident killer whales, older males are the really um, successful ones when it comes to breeding. So for uh, about between 1990 and 2010, uh, two males in our population had the majority of the offspring. Um, had, I think, upwards of 60% of the offspring. Uh, and they were, of course, the two oldest males. So if you could keep your son alive for a really long time, that's a really good way to spread your genes. And you have a, a kind of side benefit, which is because those offspring of your son are going to stay in their mother's groups, you won't have to take care of them, uh, which is which is a kind of an evolutionary benefit. So that's that's all resident killer whales. And most of what we you know about killer whale social structure comes from resident killer whales. But as we start kind of studying other populations, we start realizing that killer whale social structure might be just as varied as human social structure. Um, in Iceland, where they eat herring, uh, their social structure looks a lot more kind of what we call fission fusion, where groups come together and they split. And there might be some, you know, there are some preferred group companions that individuals have. There might be some little modules, but it's, it's much looser. Um, than, than the resident killer whales. Uh, transient killer whales, which live alongside the residents and eat mammals, have a social structure that's still matrilineal, but with a lot more dispersal. Males and females might leave their mother's group as they get older. Um, and, and then you ha there's recently there was a study in the Galapagos looking at their killer whales, and they also seem to have kind of a loose fission fusion uh, social structure. Uh, so it's really varied, it's really, uh, probably quite adapted to what the whales are eating and the environment that they live in. Um, and that's kind of the, the broad story with, with killer whales uh, around the world is like us, they've been able to spread out to pretty much every ocean niche because they are able to behaviorally adapt to it. So they're able to adjust their social structure, their feeding habits, their feeding strategies, um, their vocal communication education, everything about how they behave, they're able to adjust to whatever they need to eat in a particular area. That is just mind-blowing. <laughs> wow. Um, so we have populations which eat salmon, we have populations which eat herring. What other kind of uh, prime prey do they have, other populations? Um, there's not much in the ocean that I would say a killer whale doesn't eat somewhere. Um, the, some highlights, uh, there are killer whales in the Strait of Gibraltar, um, south of Spain, that uh, do exhaustion hunting of tuna. So they basically isolate a single tuna and chase it down until it's exhausted and then they eat it fat. Um, there are, of course, killer whales that eat um, seals. There are killer whales that specialize on porpoises and dolphins. Um, other, you know, we've seen killer whales, uh, groups of killer whales can, can chase down and eat large baleen whales. They don't seem to do that as often as you might expect, but that is one thing they can do. And then you have killer whales um, like Port and Starbird, two males off South Africa who seem to specialize in eating sharks. Wow. Um, in some cases, like LA Pod off of California, they seem to specialize in great white sharks. 
um, what they actually flip them over on their back and put them into tonic immobility, and then uh, they will just extract the liver, eat that, and leave the rest of the shark. Um, when yeah, they do this, <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty wild when you actually see the pictures of um, of these sharks that they've they've eaten. It's it's just it looks like a surgical cut. It looks like this shark has had you know liver removal surgery conducted on it rather than been you know eaten by killer whales. You have to send me a photo or a link to that so I can include it in the show notes. Oh yeah, that sounds fascinating. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I will. I will find a, a a story about that and send it your way. Um, the other thing, so killer whales obviously as top predators have this huge effect on the ecology of mm -hmm. whatever they are, and it can also be indirect. So in these areas where killer whales eat great white sharks, when they eat, uh, when they kill a great white, um, that releases pheromones into the water that warn other great whites in the area, which causes them to disperse. And there was a paper recently showing that just this one pod of killer whales, you know, a half dozen killer whales eating white sharks in this one area off California, was able to completely redistribute the ecological pressure that the sharks were putting on local seal populations. So killer whales, more so than maybe any other predator other than humans, have the ability to really kind of shape ecosystems from the, from the top down. That'd be incredible. It would be really cool to have some here in um, <laughs> in Western Australia, get a few more killer whales um, hanging out, maybe learn how to do the shark flipping technique. But that's <laughs> a, uh, that I read that, um, so since these killer whales can communicate with each other and they have these complex social structures and um, they actually share knowledge and they pass it down through the generations, I'm guessing from grandmother to mother to son or daughter so these different um pods that you're talking about around the world they don't necessarily know like each other's strategies it's not like all the killer whales evolved to be able to hunt sharks and salmon and everything but they're more specialized in terms of what their pod knows yeah so killer whales are Generally, most killer whale populations are pretty specialized. There are a few populations that seem to be kind of generalist. They seem to be able to go between, you know, eating fish and eating mammals. But uh, most of the killer whale populations we've studied are, excuse me, uh, most of the killer whale populations we've studied are quite specialized on something. And yeah, like you said, that is based on um, culture and social learning rather than genetic, you know, adaptation. Um, there is genetic differentiation between these ecotypes, but it's not enough to explain, you know, these wildly different behavioral patterns. It's, it's got to be cultural learning. Um, killer whales are, are really bad um, at innovation. And what I mean by that, so again, thinking of um, stories from captivity, which grain of salt when talking about killer whales, because captive killer whales aren't really killer whales in so much, but um, mm -hmm. what when you when you listen to trainers talk about their work with um, marine mammals in captivity, bottlenose dolphins can be trained to do a trick called show me something new, where the trainer gives a signal, the dolphin goes away for a little bit, and then they perform a sequence of tricks that they've never performed before. So that's innovation, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, killer whales cannot be trained to do that. Um, they are not good at doing something new. What they but what you can do is train a single killer whale to do something very complicated, and within a few days, every other killer whale will be doing it. So they're really good at learning from each other. So whenever an innovation does, you know, by some chance pop up, a whole population can learn it, or at least a whole, you know, a family group can learn it really quickly. Um, and we see that with, you know, the, the beach hunting that happens in some areas where killer whales intentionally beach themselves to take uh, young seals. Um, we've, we've actually observed, I haven't, but scientists have observed um, killer whales actually training young killer whales to do that. So there's actually apprenticeship that happens in training. Mm -hmm. um, we have some drone footage from the southern residents where that really kind of looks like training to hunt salmon. So most salmon hunts happen deep underwater. Chinook are, you know, pretty deep living animals. But we have this, uh, this footage of an older killer whale and a younger killer whale with a salmon at the surface, kind of just circling it and slowly trying to catch it. And either this older killer whale is doing a pretty bad job of effectively catching it, or it's letting this younger whale kind of have a chance to, to you know, try its hand at chasing 
a salmon. Um, so yeah, it's all learning. It's all, um, and, and when you get, when you get social learning leading to consistent traditions within groups, that is, that is what we would call culture, or at least what I would call culture. So yeah, killer whales have these really complex cultures. And you were saying that they have different dialects. How do you know that as a scientist? Like how, how can you tell? Do they, do different pods not communicate with each other if they live in the same area or how does it work? Um, yeah, so most of our knowledge about killer whales dialects comes from, again, studies of uh, resident killer whales in the Pacific Northwest. So um, basically what we do is we've, uh, starting, you know, way before I was, well, way before I was working on killer whales, and in fact, before I was alive, they've uh, been putting hydrophones in the water, listening to killer whale calls. And if you listen to killer whale calls long enough, you can start to pick up there are uh, call types that are repeated over and over again that are very similar. So you can actually classify different call types. Um, you can do this either by just listening yourself over and over, or in some cases, they've actually trained machine learning algorithms to pick out these different call types and classify different characteristics of these calls. Um, so these, and, and when you kind of map out which groups of animals make which call types, you can see that there are acoustic clans. So there are groups of pods uh, and groups of master lines which have dialects that have no overlap with any other uh, group. So these are what we'd call clan, a clan, clans rather. A clan of um, killer whales is a group of killer whales that makes a distinct dialect uh, or a distinct repertoire of calls with no overlap with any other group of killer whales. Within those clans, there are still distinctions. So the southern resident. Uh, population is all a single acoustic clan. They all share a common set of calls, but each pod makes those calls at different rates. So, and pods tend to have single calls that are kind of their signature. So for instance, like J-Pod has an S1 call, which if you hear it on a hydrophone, you know J-Pod's coming and it sounds a bit like a donkey. Um, uh, and then while, you know, K-Pod has the S16 call, which sounds a bit like a little kitten mew. Um, and these are really, really distinct and, and they're distinct enough that you can actually tell which pod is coming through back based on the calls. Um, in some cases, anecdotally, I've, I've noticed that pods will actually produce the call of another pod when they're on their way to meet up with that pod. So when I've been on the water with J-Pod and they've, you know, we know K-Pod is a few miles to the south and J-Pod will turn around and head towards K-Pod, they'll actually sometimes start making S-16s, the K-Pod call, which is, which is pretty cute. I don't quite know what it means, but it's pretty, it's pretty <laughs> fun. Is there any way you could actually um, sh show us these like recordings? Um, whether it's on a website somewhere or we could actually put it directly into the podcast. Yeah, so um, orcasound.net has um, a lot of, they, it, a lot of information. You can listen to Hydrophones at Lime Kiln uh, live actually on this website. So you can, when killer whales are there, you can actually hear them in real time. Mm -hmm. uh, and they also have, uh, they also have recordings of the different um, call types. Um, do you have any idea what these calls could potentially be? Do you think it's, it, do you think they have language? Like, do you think it's words or expressing certain things or just kind of making each other aware of that they're there? Yeah, so the call types are definitely not equivalent to words. The, mm -hmm. the reason being that there's only 25 of them in, in the Southern resident dialect, right? So that'd be a pretty limited language. Um, that being said, within these call types, there's a lot of variation. In, in how the calls actually are realized in the, the length and the pitch and the length of the different segments. So a lot of information could be packed in there. Um, there are studies that show that the kind of calls they produce vary depending on the behavioral state of the group. So that there are certain calls that are made more um, when animals are excited and socializing and calls that are made more when they're kind of resting. Um, doesn't necessarily get it meaning, but it kind of suggests some of the, the function is to communicate, you know, what their state is, what their emotional potentially or, or some kind of internal state is. Um, 
there's also some evidence that some of these calls might serve as contact calls. So if you're foraging and you're you know, spread out quite a bit uh, to search for salmon in a large area, it's useful to just know where someone is, who they are, and what direction you know, they are from you. So you might have, um, these calls are multi-tonal. They have a lot of different components to them that would travel through the water at different, um, different rates. So they might, you might hear different parts depending on where you're positioned from this whale. Um, and if it's also family specific, you now have information about where this whale is, how um, angle wise, like what angle they are from me, how far away they are, and if they're a member of my family group. Those are all really useful bits of information to have if you're foraging in a group. So uh, we, we also know that when they make these calls, they tend to um, repeat the same call type back and forth when they're foraging. So one whale will make an S1 and the other whale will make an S1 back and they'll kind of have these repeated bouts, which suggests it might be, a, in this case, kind of being used as a, I'm over here, okay, I'm over here, I'm over here, okay, I'm over here, just kind of back and forth to stay in contact. I don't know, I'm, I'm speechless, it's just incredible. <laughs> um, I'm guessing you would have seen the film Blackfish? Uh, a few times, yeah. <laughs> It's honestly one of my favorites, and I cry like a little baby um, at the end of it uh, every time. <laughs> but <laughs> something that they mentioned in that was how they um, they recorded a spoiler alert. <laughs> they recorded um, a mother trying to like um, vocalize to her offspring um, over long distances. So they actually recorded new sounds that they had never heard before which could travel really long distances. Have you seen anything like that in the wild? I can't say that I have. Um, so the long distance vocals they talk about there, I haven't you know, seen the recording or, or seen any you know, formal analysis of it. My guess would be for, to be a long distance vocal, it'd be mostly you know, low frequency mm -hmm. um, is probably what they're talking about, is that it's a, la it's a high intensity, low frequency sound. Those are the ones that tend to travel the furthest. Um, for instance, blue whales, you know, they communicate with really low frequencies and they can communicate across ocean basins. Uh, killer whales probably can't go that low, or, or almost sure they can't go that low, but they could, you know, they have a pretty wide range, so they could choose to make low frequency noises. I haven't encountered um, any calls that I, I could think of as, as really being that kind of thing. Um, there are certainly calls that you hear that don't tend to fit in with any given call type. We tend to think of them as like, you know, just kind of ex exclamations, kind of, you know, just you're socializing and you make a noise and it's not really a word, you just go, rah! Um, <laughs> but that being said, right, I, I, I don't have any hydrophone recordings from, uh, from any cases of a mother being separated from her calf in the wild because that doesn't tend to happen. Um, I do have, um, so when we were on the water, when we found, um, I don't know if you followed um, anything going on with J35 a couple summers ago, um, she was the whale Telequa who, um, her calf died and she carried it for 17 days. Oh yeah, I um, about that. Yeah, so the thing, we put a high, when we, the first day we found her with the calf, um, we put a hydrophone in the water and the freakiest thing for me was that when we put the hydrophone in the water with her that day, it was dead silent. Um, no one was saying anything. Oh. So, I, I don't know, I, I think, I think that there are, uh, I don't doubt that this whale had some strong emotions and, you know, with this whale in captivity had strong emotions upon being separated from its calf. Of course she did. That's, you know, um, across all cetaceans, but particularly in sperm whales, killer whales, pilot whales, the, the mother offspring bond is, you know, make probably the most important kind of bedrock of their society. That's really heartbreaking though. Um, and mm. We're kind of learning more about how important the families are because I think um, some scientists have been pointing to like mass beaching events and stuff just because some members of the pods don't want to leave um, you know the other members is that true or what yeah not so much in not <laughs> not so much in killer whales so in killer whales we don't tend to see mass strandings mm -hmm. um, we we've seen you know cases where a single whale will strand or, or become stuck in whales that its family will stick around but they don't mm -hmm. typically beach with them yeah. um pilot whales 
pilot whales, which have a potentially have a similar social structure to killer whales, probably are also matrilineal. We do tend to see these kind of mass beaching events. It's not totally clear. Um, one one hypothesis, certainly, right, is that the matriarch, the kind of leader of the pod, became confused and ill and beached herself, herself and the other whales followed. I think that's a totally reasonable hypothesis. We don't have a way to test it because we don't see the process of them becoming beach. So we don't see who's leading that movement. Um, another yeah. hypothesis would be right that the same factor caused them all to beach. So that could be, um, there's some evidence now, oddly enough, that sunspots are correlated with uh, beaching events, which the reason that that would be is because they'd be disrupting magnetic, uh, magnetic fields on earth. And if whales use magnetism to navigate, which other animals do and potentially cetaceans do as well, then that could cause them to beach. Um, if they were all exposed to the same uh, noise pollution, specifically um, certain types of sonar, that could cause them all to simultaneously beach, or if they all had a similar pathogen. So there, I, I think that there's nothing saying that the, the leadership hypothesis for these mass, mass beachings isn't happening, mm -hmm. but we would need, a, it's, it's not conclusive, you know, we need, we need a bit more evidence. Okay, fair, fair enough. Um, back to the clans and the dialects. So different clans have completely different dialects or you don't see any overlap of those vocalizations. Do you think that means they can't communicate? Like do, do whales from different clans ever run into each other or in the same area or do we see that happening? Yeah, that's a great question. So. I suspect it means that they that communication is difficult. I think there are certain things that they will be able to understand generally, you know, things about body language and posture that will be more or less universal, right? Um, even if you're from, even if you don't speak the same language, if you can tell when somebody's getting angry at you, right? Yeah. Um, but I think communication is going to be a lot more difficult. Uh, killer whales are pretty xenophobic, so killer. Oh. Whales don't tend to like killer whales of other groups. Um, even the northern and southern residents, uh, which live really close to each other, they're both residents, they eat the same things. We don't ever see them interacting with each other. Um, now, that being said, within the northern residents, animals from different clans will still interact occasionally. So, so they're, they're from different vocal clans, but they'll still kind of end up mixed up together. So. So it's not entirely based on vocalizations. There's some other kind of, you know, th there's some other indicator they're using about who is a, who is a good potential social partner. But um, the, the main example I use for killer whale xenophobia is the, um, the, the resident killer whales and the transients who live in the exact same area. Mm -hmm. um, and these two groups will absolutely avoid each other if they can. Um, if they end up in the same waterway, um, which we have seen before, they tend to go to opposite sides of the waterway if they can. Um, in some cases, the, there, there's a report, I forget what year it was from, but there's a report of um, them coming into direct contact, uh, J-Pod coming into contact with a group of transient killer whales, and just absolutely, uh, I, I don't know, can I curse on this podcast? Sure. <laughs> um, but just absolutely beating the shit out of them. Um, Whoa, really? Like they, yeah, so the residents, the transients are bigger and they're mammal eaters, but they travel in smaller groups, right? So if you're four transients versus a pod of 26 residents, um, you're not going to win that fight. And these residents were having absolutely none of these transients. Uh, and I believe that it only got broken up because a, a Washington State ferry drove through the middle of this fight and, and ended up breaking it up. No way. Um, <laughs> yeah, so so residents and transients don't get along, and I would suspect most different ecotypes of killer whales wouldn't get along very well. That's um, truly which, fascinating. But, but yeah, then what which about is interesting. Breeding? Like, yeah, they... exactly. So in, in captivity, they do breed multiple ecotypes. Um, that being said, there's not there. I don't believe there's any many cases of them successfully keeping transient killer whales in captivity for the simple fact that you'd have to feed them seals. Um, but, um, <laughs> pretty expensive. You know, pretty <laughs> expensive. But there's plenty of, you know, northeastern 
uh, or North uh, Atlantic killer whales in captivity that have been housed with Pacific killer whales in captivity. It's possible that since the, they would have never encountered each other um, you know, in the wilds, uh, they don't actually even know if they should avoid each other. Um, I know different ecotypes have been interbred in captivity, so it's certainly possible to do. That being said, we know that aggression levels are way higher in captivity. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly a lot of that can be attributed to the fact that, you know, when aggressive encounters uh, start happening in killer whale groups in the wild, you can break it up. You have a whole ocean to kind of break up and, and, and take a breather, whereas uh, in captivity, there's nowhere to go. Some of that could also be attributed to, um, you know, some, at least for the whales who were captured in the wild, um, rather than bred in, in captivity, uh, some of that could be attributed to difficulties in communication or some of this, you know, xenophobia we see in, in wild populations. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, they've, they've certain, they certainly have bred multiple ecotypes in captivity. So there's, it's possible that with enough acclimation, they kind of get over it or maybe there's something else going on when you have two ecotypes that have never encountered each other um, in the wild. I think this is a perfect segue to um, chatting about uh, killer whales in captivity. Um, so the only mm -hmm. kind of knowledge I have about it, or most of it, uh, is from Blackfish, which is a very sad story of um, Tilikum, which is one of the most famous um, killer whales ever, I'd say, apart from maybe Free Willy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, interestingly, I haven't seen that movie. I should maybe add that to the list. <laughs> oh, you gotta see it. You can't, you can't be a real killer whale geek and not, not see Free Willy. It's, it, I, it's a classic. All right, I'll, I'll get on that. Um, classic. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so that's what I know of killer whales in captivity, which you know, mm. showed me that these extremely intelligent creatures are basically put in tiny little rooms they're fully in lockdown like we're feeling bad for ourselves <laughs> right now during quarantine you know like oh, yeah no, I can't leave my house may only go to the shops yet these creatures are you know stuck in these tiny pools for their entire life or from the point that either they're born or then captured in the wild and brought into it um so as you said you know um they have killer whales from different um, clans or e ecotypes? What? Yeah, yeah, ecotypes. And so ecotypes would be the, the kind of broad categorization of like resident, transient, North Pacific herring eaters, that kind of thing. And then within those, you might have vocal clans, yeah. Yeah, so they're basically put in captivity with whales that they don't necessarily speak the same dialect with. They don't have you know, that commu communication, it's not from their pod, it's not in their, it's not their family, and killer whales are creatures which live with their families their whole lives, so <laughs> I don't even know how to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah <Okay>. so <laughs> yeah, you, that's all, that's all true, so the, the, the biggest issue to me, I, I alluded to this earlier when I mentioned that I don't, mm -hmm. I don't think of killer whales in captivity as, as kind of really killer whales, the reason I say that is not to like be mean to captive killer whales. The reason I say that is because killer whales, as far as I can tell, everything about them and their identity is tied up in social structure. And whether that's yeah. their matrilineal social structure or in the case of these other populations that are less matrilineal, they're, you know, they're the groups they end up in as adults. Regardless, they're, they're kind of, their identity seems to be tied up with um, who they are, you know, together with, who they're with. And when you have these groups where they don't get to choose who they're with in the first place, they're going to end up with animals who maybe don't, you know, have the same set of calls or behaviors or, um, you know, tendencies as them. And then throughout their life, they might get moved around at random intervals because, you know, they need a breeding male here or they need a new performer here or, you know, whatever, or they wanted to sell a killer whale to some park somewhere else. Um, because of that, it's, it's really hard to think of them in the same way as I think of the wild killer whale and to, to translate any kind of research we get on them over to, to wild killer mm. whales. Um, yeah, and it's, it is, it is, 
uh, it's impossible for me to think about a case in captivity where you would have an adequate captive environment for a killer whale. They, they travel hundreds of miles a day, potentially, um, in the wilds. They, uh, they have very specific hunting patterns. They have specific things they like to eat and specific ways they like to hunt those things. They so when they socialize, even when you watch killer whale socialization, it takes place over an area like three times the size of a, of a tank. Just they're socializing. Um, they yeah, there, there's there's it's not really possible to provide an adequate um, captive environment for these killer whales. Um, that being said, right? Um, so SeaWorld has, at least as far as we know, stopped any breeding programs which is, I think, the right move. You, you can't yeah. keep breeding killer whales in captivity. And SeaWorld, you know, the vast majority of killer whales in captivity are housed by SeaWorld. Without the SeaWorld whales, the captive killer whale population isn't viable in the long term. Mm -hmm. So if they hold true to what they've said they're gonna do, in a few decades time, um, there will be no more killer whales in captivity, which I think is great. Most killer whales in captivity were born there. They were born in a captive environment. Those whales will never be able to be wild again. They'll never, the, the sad fact of it is they will never be able to be wild killer whales. Um, the few killer whales that are in captivity right now that were captured in the wild, and actually Tillicum, um, he's dead now, but he was captured in the wild as well. There is the possibility that we could try to, to release them. It would be really difficult. We've never successfully released a killer whale that's been in captivity, you know, for most of its life Have back into the wild. Keiko, so the whale who played free, who played Willie in Free Willie, oh, yeah. um, they, they tried to release him and they did successfully release him. He swam with killer whales, but he, he didn't survive very long out there. Oh. Um, he did, he died of pneumonia throughout the whole time. He would frequently come back to, you know, um, uh, ha um, kind of, cities and stuff on the coast and interact with people oh no <laughs> um yeah uh, so he the, the thing to think of though is that keiko was not a good candidate for release the reason being we had no idea what social group of killer whales he came from he was captured relatively young from from the wild um and he had a ton of health problems which came from, you know, being kept in, in sub-ideal conditions for most of his life. If you watch Free Willy, you'll see that he has these horrible, horrible lesions on his pectoral flippers, um, just from the quality of the water, probably, that he was swimming in. So he was actually not a great candidate. We have another candidate in uh, Miami Seaquarium right now, who's Lolita, who is actually a Southern resident, killer whale. She's been in captivity for 40 years. Um, uh, we know that she's a member of LPOD. We know that she still responds to LPOD calls. Um, and we're pretty sure we actually know which subgroup of LPOD she was from. We believe, based on the photos from the day she was captured, that she's probably related to L25, who's the oldest member of LPOD right now. So it would have to be a slow, delicate, careful process of introducing her to a sea pen first in the area, slowly, slowly rehabilitating her, make sure she can forage for herself, make sure she's absolutely healthy, she's not gonna bring any kind of pathogen back to the Southern mm -hmm. residents, um, and then slowly introducing her to Elpod when we get a chance and seeing if, if she can integrate. Um, so she would probably be the best candidate for release at this point, um, but, but every other, killer whale in captivity, unfortunately, is never going to be wild. There are talks of, you know, building a killer whale sanctuary. There's actually, you know, ongoing efforts to do that. Um, and I believe they've chosen to build it in Nova Scotia at this point, but we'll see how that, how that pans out. You know, it's, it's a huge task, both, you know, just monetarily to mm -hmm. acquire killer whales, build a habitat for them, and then to feed them every year, you know, to feed and take care of them year after year after year. It's a huge, huge task. Um, and it's going to be really challenging, I think, for, for that team to be able to accomplish that. But, um, yeah, I think that's kind of the best case scenario for these whales at this point, right, is getting 
retired to as big of a CPEN as you can get, being kept healthy and fed mm -hmm. for the rest of their lives, but not having to perform, not being in a concrete tank. Um, yeah. I, was a bit I was a bit worried initially that they were going to try to put this whale sanctuary in southern resident habitat, which would, you know, potentially have some unintended consequences, but it looks like that's not going to happen. So at this point, yeah, that's kind of the best case scenario. Oh, I didn't know that about Lolita. I'm feeling really emotional now. Can you, like, her family is still out there, you know? Do you think they'd recognize her? Killer whales have long memories. Um, so potentially, if she could still make LPOD calls um, convincingly, I think they, they might recognize her. Obviously, she was a calf last time they saw her. She's just a little, a little baby. Um, but they seem to remember the day that she was captured. They seem to remember... Um, they seem to remember the captures that happened uh, during that time, and they seem to be, they tend to avoid a lot of the coves where the captures took place. Oh, really? um, and yeah, so, so they, they don't tend to go into some of those coves anymore. Um, they, so yeah, I think there's a, there's a chance. We don't know, right? We know that dolphins have decades long memories of individuals. Um, Dolphins in captivity that have been separated for decades when they put them back together have clearly been able to recognize each other. Um, but we don't know for killer whales. Um, but we, we I, I, I have, I have, I'm optimistic about it. I, I think that L25 would recognize her if she was, if she was in fact a close relative. Wow. That's, that's just astonishing to think that, you know, that is, Maybe something that, uh, you know, people can be working towards you know, getting her back out to the wild. Um, what yeah. Is, what is her situation right now? Is she still performing or like what's happening? Yes. So oh. she is housed completely on her own, um, aside from a few dolphins that are housed with her um, in a tank that is, uh, by current legal requirements, too small. It's not as deep as she is long. What? Um so by current standards, it's illegal, but it, the tank was built prior to those new standards being put in place, so it was grandfathered in. Um, yeah, and as you know, the, there's, there's ongoing efforts, um, mostly Howard Garrett at Orca Network has really led a lot of these efforts mm -hmm. um, to try to get her released, but it's, I mean, as she's a huge money-making tool for the Miami Seaquarium. You know, she's their killer whale, and she draws in crowds and makes them millions of dollars. So uh, it's really hard to try to convince them to, to do the right thing in this case. That's heartbreaking. So of course, apart from killer whales in captivity, what, what do you see as some of the other dangers facing um, killer whale populations? Yeah, so um, for my population, the, the southern residents in particular, the main thing right now is a lack of food. So they mm -hmm. are salmon specialists, they specialize actually almost entirely on Chinook salmon. So around 80% of their diet is Chinook salmon, which is an endangered species of salmon. Um, so the main thing for them is just uh, when salmon is low, killer whale mortality is high, killer whale birth rates are low. Um, and we've seen in since the 90s, in the 90s, there were nearly 100 southern residents. Uh, as of today, there are 72. Um, so the main thing is we need to get salmon stocks, specifically the Fraser River salmon stocks in British Columbia. Those need to be recovered um, because they've crashed since, since the early 2000s. And since then we haven't seen any population growth and actually seen continued declines. Uh, along with that, uh, there's issues with toxins in water, particularly pers persistent organic pollutants like PCBs. Mm -hmm. which uh, are not just a threat to the southern residents, but are a threat to killer whales all around the world. Because they're top predators, um, anything that's in the environment that can stick around in animals' bodies, any toxins, gets magnified in them. Um, so killer whales are some of the most toxic mammals on the planet because they just, they're just they so far up the food chain um, that anything that sticks around is just in the, really, really heavily concentrated in these whales. What we tend to find, though, is a lot a lot of these toxins are lipophilic. They like fats. They stick to mm -hmm. fats. So they tend to hang out in the blubber of these killer whales. And they, it's not good to have toxins in your blubber, obviously, but it's better than having them in your blood. Mm 
And unless you're using that blubber for energy, because you're going through a period where you can't, you can't eat, oh. they tend to be able to deal with it okay. So the transient killer whales are much more toxic than the southern residents, but their population is actually growing really quickly because they eat seals and there's a lot of seals around right now. Um, whereas the southern residents are less toxic, but because they are having to regularly dip into these blubber reserves to keep themselves, uh, you know, keep themselves afloat basically, keep themselves energized, uh, those PCBs are being released into their bloodstream, making them more vulnerable to disease, you know, making them uh, causing pregnancies to fail in some cases. So uh, it's, it's really kind of a combination of making sure whales have enough food. And well, we can't really take the, the problem is they're persistent organic pollutants. So some of these pollutants that are killing them have been outlawed for decades now, but they're still in the environment. Yeah. So we need to continue to identify pollutants that should be banned and get them out of the system. The sooner we get them out of the system, the sooner we get them out of production, the sooner they'll be out of the ocean ecosystem. We need to focus on making sure killer whales uh, and other marine mammals have every chance to deal with the stuff that's already there and can't be taken out. Um, and then the other thing that is just true of every species on earth, and this mm -hmm. is kind of the big picture thing, right? Killer whales, like every other animal, are, going, are not going to deal well with climate change. Mm -hmm. um, we're already seeing it in the southern residents. One of the things that is really hurting the salmon stocks is the fact that their spawning rivers are too warm. Mm -hmm. um, when salmon fry get in fresh water that's above 70 degrees Fahrenheit, they start to just die. Um, and that's happening in a lot of these rivers regularly each year. Uh, and because of that, there's not enough salmon for these killer whales. So everything has upstream effects. Um, and that's going to be true of killer whales that we haven't studied as well, but um, still, if they, if they rely, if they're top predators, that means that their position up there is dependent on having a healthy ecosystem um, kind of below them. And that is dependent on having a climate that is not gonna kill the things at the bottom of the food chain. Mm -hmm. oh, that's definitely something we're fighting for. Um in all areas of conservation, the whole climate change issue. Um, yeah, it does, it, uh, it feels a little, almost like a cliche at this point to end a conservation message talking about climate change, but it really is, it really is kind of the, the main <laughs> thing right now. That's, if we're talking about killer whales worldwide and, and things we can actually do to, to try to help all of them, it's, it, that's it. Well, that leads me perfectly to the last question of the podcast, which is, what is the one piece of advice you would give people landlocked or living by the sea who want to help killer whales in the ocean? So what is one way they can try slow climate change from your opinion? Um, I'm going to get a bit up on my soapbox here. Uh, <laughs> I think that there's there's plenty of individual actions, right, that people have been told about all the time. You know, take mm -hmm. take fewer flights, don't drive as much, um, yada, yada, yada. Those are all great. That's fine. I try to do them. I don't eat meat because I, I am worried about the carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, 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 I agree with doing the individual things. Climate change is not a problem that can solely be addressed by individuals making individual actions. It's a systematic pro problem that comes from uh, unregulated capitalism. And the only way to affect it, to solve it in the long term, is to change that system. So if there's one thing I could tell people to help killer whales and every other animal on the planet, it's vote for people who take climate change seriously. Vote for politicians who think climate change matters, and it's something we need to address in a major systematic, systemic way. Do all the individual stuff. There's nothing wrong with that, and it's great. It, it does help, right? If everybody does little things, it does slow it. It, it help, buys us time. But the only way we're going to solve it is by having people in government who care enough to do something. So, yeah, vote. Find out who you can vote for that takes climate change seriously. That's national level in the states, state level, local government, everything. And go out and vote for those people. Beautifully put. Go out and vote, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, vote. Vote for the vote to save the whales. 
<laughs> Very well done. Vote to save the whales. <laughs> Uh, Michael, you have no idea how happy I am that you joined us here today. I learned so much and I still have a million questions. So if you ever have anything uh, you know you want to share uh, with with um, fellow whale lovers, then make sure to let me know because we would be delighted to have you back on the Ocean Hanging Podcast. <laughs> Great. Yeah, no, this was this was excellent. I had a lot of fun. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.